Thank you. I will just mention briefly at the beginning that although I do work for the US Fish and Wildlife Service, I will likely be mentioning some policy opinions and perspectives that are mine and mine only and not those of the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So today I'm going to be talking to you about something a little bit different than what we've been talking about so far. And it's going to be more of a case study perspective of what goes wrong when we don't control diseases and they do spill over and begin to affect biodiversity. And specifically, I'll be speaking from the context of amphibians. So for many decades, we've known that amphibians are essentially canaries in the coal mine. They're very sensitive to environmental changes and especially degradation, and that we've been looking at things like climate change and pollution and habitat destruction and overcollection as sources of their decline. But then we're starting to realize more recently that what's making everything decline even faster are diseases, and specifically one called amphibian chytrid fungus. I'll mention a little bit later, um, I'm, I'm making a little bit of a generalization by saying chytrid fungus. There are actually hundreds of species of chytrid fungi in the world. Uh, many of them are beneficial to the environment. Um, but there are two, uh, until recently there was one, but now we know there are two that in particular are attacking living vertebrate hosts, causing pathology, death, and extinction. And what I'm going to show you now really quick is just a short video clip that myself and my colleague Katie Garrett recently produced to accompany an article that was actually just published last week in Science about the global amphibian extinction crisis. Um, I do want to ask really quick, by a, a raise of hands, how many of you before today had actually heard of amphibian chytrid fungus and that the world is experiencing an amphibian extinction crisis? Cool. That's actually more than I expected, and I'm very pleased by that. Um, so now I'm going to, oh wait, sorry. First, <laughs> first I'll mention that within the perspective of OIE, there are three diseases that affect amphibians that are officially listed as notifiable, going back as far as 2007. So in 2007, both infection with Batrachochytrium dendrobatidis, which is amphibian chytrid fungus, and infection with rhinoviruses were listed. And then about 10 years later, um, infection with the second amphibian chytrid fungus, Batrachochytrium salamandrovorans, which specifically attacks salamanders, was then listed. And now we'll show the quick video clip. And that was um, a video summary of a paper that was led by my colleague, Dr. Ben Scheel from Australia, um, and about 40 other co-authors, basically announcing to the world that 
this pathogen that we already knew was really serious was actually more than twice as devastating as we thought for the past decade. Um, that now we know a conservative estimate is that at least 500 amphibian species have or are significantly declining from this pathogen, and about 90 of those have already gone extinct in just the past 50 years. So while in this context, in this room, we talk a lot about single pathogens that do cause really severe mass mortalities in production systems. Um, but as far as biodiversity, you know, we're often talking about single or just a few species that are impacted by a certain pathogen. Whereas here, what's really scary is that chytrid has such a low host species specificity that it can infect and cause disease and decline in nearly 7,000 species. And also similarly to a lot of the other things we've heard about how these diseases spread, um, chytrid is highly uh, associated with water. Um, so it's spreading through the movement of water. It also spreads through direct animal to animal contact. And it can also persist outside the host for some period of time, um, potentially for a couple days and up to even maybe a couple months. As you mentioned, it is also global in distribution right now. Um, a lot of what I mentioned today could actually, for every one slide, could be several slides. It's a lot more complicated. Um, we do now know that there are multiple isolates, many, many different lineages of chytrid around the world. So it has been slowly changing once it gets to different countries. And its virulence is also varying according to its lineage. So when we attribute to the, these mass declines to chytrid, a lot of the times what we're really talking about is one single strain called the global pathogenic lineage. So what you see when we map the distribution is actually a lot more complicated with moving, mixing strains, which are beginning to cause unpredictable outcomes. So for the past 20 years or so, we've been wrestling with amphibian chytrid fungus. And although I mentioned it could affect you know, potentially any species of amphibian, it didn't seem that salamanders were showing disease or decline. So while conservationists were a bit relieved by that, uh, a number of years ago in Europe, uh, fire salamanders started declining dramatically, nearly to the point of extinction in the Netherlands. Um, when it was investigated whether this frog fungus was associated and it wasn't, uh, scientists were scratching their heads until they realized it was a very similar fungus which we now call Betrachochytrium salamandrivorans. Um, this fungus is believed to have evolved and originated in Asia, which is also potentially true for the other species I was speaking about, and then was imported to Europe through the pet trade, spilled over, and it's now becoming established in multiple countries. And this just, summarize, this, this just summarizes that and also mentions that What's novel in this circumstance is that unlike for the other species of chytrid fungus, which is in dozens and dozens of countries, as of now, we only have confirmed reports of this pathogen in several European countries. And extensive surveillance in the United States has, has not yet detected it. So as far as we know, it is not yet in the Americas. I'll also, also mention, just as a throw-in, um, while we're speaking about chytrid fungus, that we also shouldn't forget about things called ronaviruses, because these pathogens also have the ability to jump classes. So while I mentioned that chytrid is really severe because it's causing extinction in frogs, we don't often talk about ronavirus as much because we haven't associated any known extinctions from ronaviruses being a primary source. But from a biodiversity perspective, ronaviruses, certain kinds, can cross classes between amphibians, reptiles, and fish, and cause mortality in all three. And when you look at the number of species potentially impacted, it's pretty staggering. So as I mentioned, just to reiterate, that the reason why these pathogens are so novel and so scary to us in conservation is just the, the broad scale impact across species within a class. And it's almost like saying that we have, what if we had a pathogen that affected mammals on a similar scale? But then you'd have you know, five or 6% of all mammal species would be potentially going extinct from one single pathogen. Chytrid spreads through a variety of different ways. Um, this is mainly what I studied for my, my PhD thesis to understand how much of this is linked to trade and is linked to human causes versus natural spread. 
And long story short, basically every different pathway I investigated, I found chytrid spreading. Um, and also ronavirus along with it. And there was often co-infection. But what I'll mention today, because that's the topic, is mostly trade. And the reason why trade in particular is, is such a smoking gun for causing new outbreaks and new, new waves of disease are, are several fold. And first off, not only do we have just an, an extraordinary high number of live amphibians transported globally every year between pets, food, and research, but the conditions in which they're being transported also contributes to higher transmission rates and partly due to likely immunosuppression. So you have conditions in which animals are being shipped in very high densities in water with aquatic pathogens. And even during surveillance that I've done at airports, um, I have found very high rates of infection. And that is likely a gross underestimate, because that doesn't take into account the transmission that likely happened in the previous 48 hours. Also, the packing materials in which these animals are shipped, I have often found to be positive for these diseases, for these pathogens. And as I mentioned, we do know that some of them have extended persistence outside of a host. And that's what makes this even scarier, because you might think, OK, well, amphibians are spreading pathogens. We'll you know, pay a lot of attention to how we handle them, not let them escape. But we might not be thinking about the cardboard boxes, thousands and thousands of cardboard boxes shipping, for example, bullfrogs, which over half of them that I swabbed with a simple swab were very positive for ronavirus and chytrid. So how are we disposing those outside? So speaking of regulation, um, there has been some recent action taken by a variety of countries in response to the salamander chytrid fungus, being that it is seen as a more novel emerging disease. So in the United States, several years ago, the US Fish and Wildlife Service did enact uh, le legislation under the Lacey Act, which listed 201 species as injurious, essentially banning them from import to prevent the importation of species known or expected to be reservoir hosts of this pathogen. Then a year later, Canada also implemented some legislation preventing the, prohibiting the importation of all salamanders. And more recently, in 2018, Europe took some action as well and has, has created some legislation that prohibits the importation and trade between member states of salamanders without following certain very strict protocols for quarantine and, and transport. But I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned and a lot of take home messages here about what we might have been doing wrong or could have been doing better. Um, and while I think we've learned a lot from the frog situation, um, we sometimes feel like we've been responding faster and quicker for the salamander issue. Um, but I tend to disagree. Um, if you look at the actions, for example, taken by Europe and Canada, it's interesting to consider how their diversity in species potentially impacted in the wild is far, far less than what would happen if it arrived in North America. Yet, so far in the United States, we've only stopped one third of the trade in salamanders. And I think that although we've been developing rapid response programs for what would happen if it were to arrive and spillover were to occur, the one topic of discussion that I fail to see happening at the level that it should is what would a rapid response look like? We've never before had an opportunity in the world of amphibians to try an eradication attempt and try to prevent what we've been basically documenting for the past 20 years with the frog hatred situation. And I feel that if we do not have those serious conversations right now about what kind of drastic measures would, be, would we be willing to take, whether it be draining a lake or capturing and culling, you know, what be it, then I feel that we're just reverting back to triage and research monitoring the spread of a deadly pathogen that very quickly will become uncontrollable. And part of the difficulty with combating chytrid fungus, um, which was mentioned in some of the previous discussions today in other diseases, is that once this arrives at a new location and becomes established, it is not something that we can safely eradicate. So basically, we're stuck with it. 
And we're at the point where we have to try to find solutions that are scalable um, and longer term. But right now, we don't have those. We have methods that can suppress the infection and sometimes cure animals in captivity. But they do not have a significant learned immune response. So we are unable, at least at this time, to make anything resembling a vaccine. So the question is, well, what do we do with trade? We know that a lot of this is spilling over from the trade, and it's continuing on a very large scale every day. Could we have a cleaner amphibian trade? And I think that's a really important topic to think about at length, because often when we talk about regulation, the trade is quick to you know, have a knee-jerk reaction and think that we're working against them as scientists or as regulators. And I wholly disagree with that. I think there's many opportunities um, to try to develop methods with the pet trade and the food trade, because the trade in salamanders and frogs is not that large considering what most of you in this room deal with. And I think it's a really important learning opportunity to prevent the next outbreak. And what I'm afraid of is that if we don't do this now for the frogs and the salamanders, we're going to start seeing more and more viral and fungal pathogens emerge from the wildlife trade that are of a scale that has low host species specificity. And sooner or later, they will affect other species that might be more closely tied to agriculture and economic production. So specifically, for example, you know, what could we be doing in the United States that we're not right now? And so as part of my PhD thesis, I, I considered that at length. And there had some, been some previous proposals for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service to basically ban the entire amphibian trade and say, OK, several thousand species can never come back into the country commercially um, for pets or food. And I think that you know, it, it did reflect the severity of what's at stake, but it was a bit misguided in risk analysis and being realistic from a regulatory perspective of how do we do this in a stepwise, stepwise approach. So I looked at all trade over a number of years and found that, OK, although we've imported, say, about 300 species commercially, only several of those species compose more than 50% of all animals by volume. And in those top few, a couple of them are known confirmed reservoir hosts for these pathogens. And that's the American bullfrog and African clawed frog. And that if we were to simply target all of our effort right now on regulating and, and controlling the spread of those two species, which are also invasive species, that basically overnight, we could essentially stop an incredible amount of pathogens entering the country. And the reason why I also mentioned ronavirus earlier was that there are a lot of parallels between these three pathogens. And I feel that if we were to take action on any one of these, we would basically be controlling all three at the same time. And I think that makes a lot of economic sense, but also a lot of sense for biodiversity. That if some of you were interested in controlling the spread of ronavirus because you're concerned about it infecting your fish, then you're also potentially doing a great service for the amphibians of the world. And I glossed over a lot of complicated stuff really fast. So I hope that I've been able to interest you in these issues that you might not have heard of. And please do reach out to me. And I'd love to talk more. <laughs>